All right, so tonight I'm actually doing something a little bit different. I'm doing much more expository preaching, going through Hebrews chapter 11. Normally I do a lot of topical sermons on Sundays, but tonight I thought it would be a good, you know, we, we had just been going through a lot of f uh, foundational principles, the fundamental beliefs uh, that we have in this church. You know, I covered salvation and baptism and the Word of God, you know, in the King James Bible and all these other topics. And I was kind of thinking, you know, this is steering a little bit from that, but, but not quite. Hebrews 11 is such a great chapter. It's known as the faith chapter. It's all about faith and all these great people, the Bible, all through going through the Old Testament and, and the great things they did through faith. And we're going to go through just kind of verse by verse through ch uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and, and see what we can uh, learn just about faith and about the lives of these people. And overarching, what I want to emphasize... Because we all know, everyone that's in here, I believe tonight is saved, and we know that salvation comes by grace through faith, right? The faith is, is the absolutely essential. What we need to be saved is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what I want to point out tonight are the actions that are taken out by the people who had faith. It's one thing to have faith and be saved, right? And praise the Lord for it. We're trying to get more people saved. But it's another thing to use that faith to take that faith and do something with it and show other people and be obedient unto the Lord. And we're going to go through all these different examples. I'll tell you what, out of, out of the, most of the Christians, that, you know, people who are saved today, how many of those are actually going forward and using something and doing something with that? I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's very many. Uh, and, and one of the evidence of that is just the way our, our society, our culture is just kind of just going down the tubes and going down the toilets. Sure. We need to have a lot more people being more vocal. Christians, I mean, people who believe in God's word, standing up and, you know, preaching from the housetops the word of the Lord and, and exhibiting their faith. Like I said, it's one thing to have a faith. The Bible says in James chapter 2, but faith without works is dead. Now, I don't use that verse or abuse that verse in teaching that you must have works in order to be saved. No, no, no. No, but however, James chapter 2 is teaching that being justified before man's eyes, you know, that's why it says, you know, show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works. This is how other people can see that you have faith. It's by your actions. It's by your works, the things that you do. It's one thing to say that you have faith, but it's another thing to show people that you have it. And I believe that's what James 2 is, is referring to and talking about. So it says, why did, what does it profit? You know, if someone comes to you and they're in need of clothing or they're, they're in need of food, and you just say, yeah, yeah, here, you know, be fed and be warmed and you don't do anything for them, that doesn't profit them anything. But if you actually do something for them, then it profits them. We could have faith, and you know, this is what I try to explain to people all the time that don't understand the, the soul winning efforts that we do, and we go out and knock on doors, and we talk to people, and we try to give them the gospel of Christ. Hey, it's one thing for you to, to be saved and to sit at home on the couch and just, just week after week, hey, you've got a free gift. Praise God for it, but what are you doing with that gift? What, are you just sitting there and not letting anybody else in this whole world know about the free gift of salvation that's available to them? I mean, it, it, it's, pretty, it's a pretty selfish thing to do to say, hey, well, at least I'm saved, I'm covered, and I'm just going to go about my own life and do whatever I want to do. We need more people to take that gift, the people that are saved, to, to go out and bring that to other people. And we're going to get some really good examples here in Hebrews chapter 11 of people who did that, who did that very thing and did some very difficult things. I want you to think about if you were faced with some of the decisions that these people had to make in their lives, what decision you would make. We need our faith to grow. We want our faith to increase. And we want to be able to show our faith by being obedient unto the Lord. So let's start off here in verse number one. He starts off defining faith, saying, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I know for a fact that I'm going to heaven when I die. I know that heaven is a real place. You say, well, how can you know that? You, you can't even see it. You know, there's no scientific evidence that could prove that, that God exists in this realm that's called heaven, right? And there's this place. But look, I know it exists. And my faith and faith of others is the evidence of that even being real, which is, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. You know, 
we hope for things that we can't see. There's a lot of things that we hope for that we can't see. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we know that he's coming. Now, we can't physically see that right now, but we believe that. We have faith. We know that it's going to happen. Receiving a new body, right? That's something the Bible tells us that we're going to receive, that, that these, old, these old mortal flesh bodies are going to be done away. And when Jesus Christ comes back again, we're going to have these brand new bodies that's, that we're not going to have pain or discomfort and all the, all the hassles uh, as a result of the sinful body that we have now. We're going to be getting these great new bodies. Heaven itself and, and the new Jerusalem coming down out of the clouds. Hey, these are all things that we're looking forward to, that we have hope in, that we're looking to see happen and that you know happens. But... We have to take these things on faith because you can't see them. And what the Bible is explaining here in verse number one is that the evidence that any of these things even exist is our faith. Faith is the evidence. And our belief and confidence that they are real, that is the evidence. Now, to the, to the atheist, you know, the scientific world, that statement might seem like foolishness. And it does. They'll say, you know, you're using circular reasoning, you're using the Bible to, to, you know, because you believe the Bible, you say it's true. Well, faith is the evidence of things not seen. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, we were just talking about this earlier, the Bible says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It's foolish. The, the unsaved world, by and large, you know, the, the, the atheists, the scoffers, the people that are going to make fun of you for believing the Bible, Preaching about the cross, preaching from the Bible, to them it's just foolishness. And they're going to listen to the words coming out of my mouth and saying, that guy's an idiot. That guy is a fool. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. <coughs> we recognize these words as being God's breathed words. That this is scripture that comes from the Lord, and this is truth, and this is where everything exists. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning of the sermon, you know, faith is required for salvation. And what I find the irony in is that atheists are continually seeking proof that God exists, right? They want to say, well, give me, show me evidence, show me the proof that God exists. The only evidence that they're going to get is our faith. And that's it. That's, that's all they're going to be able to receive. Because the bottom line is, there is no evidence that they are looking for to prove that God exists, which is why it must be taken by faith. None will accept. I'm sorry? None will accept. There's plenty of evidence. There's just none will accept. Well, here's the thing. No, it's, there, there's, the evidence is our faith, but it doesn't mean that believing the Bible to be God's word is unreasonable. Right? So they're looking for concrete proof. Right? And, 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 and I don't believe that there is, that, that you can just, you know, scientifically prove that God exists. But there is plenty of reasonable, you know, plenty of reasons to believe that God is true. We have, for one, the Holy Word. And this is the most important. You have prophecies that have been written down and fulfilled later. Right? There's lots of re good reasons to believe. That this is true. But you can't even take this and scientifically prove that, that everything happened the way it did. You know, there's a lot of doubt that can be cast on this and a lot of variables that if you were to examine it in a scientific setting, you know, and, and, and try to prove it mathematically, that it's not going to meet the requirements that they're going to look for proof. But... There's plenty of, uh, of reasons to believe. I mean, you just look at the creation. Right, the way everything works together. There's lots of, of uh, reasons why a reasonable person would, would believe the Bible to be true. But uh, the bottom line is you can't scientifically prove that God exists. And you know what? That's fine with God because um, God tells us that, that the evidence of things not seen is our faith. And look at verse number, number 3 of Hebrews 11. The Bible says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. This is talking about the creation. You know, and what does is, what is the scientific world tell you today of, of how the worlds were framed? That the things which are seen were, were basically just appeared out of nowhere, were made of things which do appear. This is what he's saying. The things which are seen were not, were not made of things which do appear, just just appeared out of nowhere. 
But science has no explanation. Other than going to God, there is no good explanation. They're saying, oh, well, there's this big bang. Well, what was the big bang? It used to be, it used to be a small, you know, this really condensed matter. The whole universe all condensed into one small thing, one small piece of matter the size of a period on a page. And then from there, it got even smaller. And then they say, well, basically, it was nothing. It's got so small to where it just, you can't even see it. It's just infinitesimally small and that nothing exploded and became everything. But I'm the foolish one, right? I'm the foolish one for believing that God created the world when, when the scientific community is going to tell you that nothing exploded and that's how we got everything. It takes more faith to believe that. It, absolutely. It takes way more faith to be godless, to be, to be an atheist, to try to believe in these 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 theories that man comes up with trying to explain why, how we even got here than it does to just believe that God created everything. Absolutely. Now, keep a, keep a finger here. I want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll come back to Hebrews chapter 11. Because kind of from this point forward in Hebrews 11, we're going to start seeing people being referenced now. You know, we start off defining faith, and then we see, um, you know, through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, that God's actual literal word is what created everything. You know, God said, let there be light, and there was light. I mean, God spake this world into existence. And that's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, and, and that's what we believe. It's, it's, it's the truth. But um, from this point forward, we're going to start seeing people in the Bible um, being recognized for their faith by the things that they've done. In 2 Corinthians 4, look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, we, have, we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. The reason why I point that verse out is because if you have faith tonight, if you believe, therefore we ought to be speaking. You ought to be able to, to communicate that faith that you have unto others. It's something that we should do, and we should be doing it because we believe. He says, I believe, therefore have I spoken. I mean, why would you not talk about the things that you believe to be true in your heart? Flip back, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going we're gonna to read through some of these... Um, some of these great, we're not going to go through the entire chapter, but we're going to go cover quite a bit of it. I know we read the whole chapter before we got started tonight. It explains in verse number four, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. So here we see Abel being righteous. Again, it's not because... He's not righteous because of what he did, because of the sacrifice. He's righteous because of his faith. And by faith, he offered the correct sacrifice unto the Lord. He was obedient. God wanted the animal sacrifice, which is, which is, of course, the foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus Christ being shed for the remission of our sins. That was the sacrifice that he required. What did Cain do? He brought the best of his own works, the best of his own hands when he brought the, the, his, his uh, yield of, of crops from the field and brought that to, to offer unto the Lord, whereas Abel brought the animal sacrifice. But the Bible is saying here is that by faith, it, it, it was Abel's faith that he said, look, I'm just going to obey God. God said he wants this type of offering. This is what I'm going to bring unto him. So by faith, he offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. So his actions of bringing the right sacrifice was showing his faith in God, showing that he believed God, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse number six but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, there's a lot of people today that, that believe that they're, they're pleasing God, but they don't even have the proper faith in him. They don't believe that, that he's the creator of the world. They don't believe um, that he actually is, is the Lord. He is God. And it's impossible to please God unless you believe that he is. Let's keep going here. Verse number seven. 
By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah is a great example of someone exhibiting their faith. In Noah's days, it hadn't rained upon the earth. So he's been told to, to build this great ark, a big boat, right? In the middle of the land. Not, you know, just, just in the middle of his, of his land, in the middle of his yard or whatever. Noah, I want you to build a big boat. Because I'm going to send a flood on this earth and, and this, this boat's going to save you. That takes some faith. I mean, where is this going to come from? Nothing like that had ever happened before in the creation of the earth. It took a lot of faith and it took a lot of time. He built a huge ark. I mean, it was, built, it was big enough to, to carry, you know, two of every kind of animal and seven of some other animals onto that boat. And he had to prepare all this stuff, prepare all his food, get everything ready to go. I mean, he would have looked like, like nowadays, you know, people have the, the doomsday preppers and you're like, oh man, that guy's nuts over there. They would have been looking at Noah like he's this nut doomsday prepper. Oh yeah, God's going to destroy the world. Yeah, yeah, right, Noah. And, um... You know, I have nothing against doomsday preppers. I, I think it's wise to be prepared for, for hard times to come. But um, we see Noah here was the ultimate doomsday prepper, and he probably got a lot of flack for that from the people around him. But you know what? He had faith. It didn't matter what people would say about him. It didn't matter if people would call him nuts. Because he knew and believed in God, and he acted accordingly. See, it would be one thing for Noah to just say, you know, for God to tell Noah, okay, I'm going to destroy the, the earth with a flood. And for him just to say, okay, and just sit there and do nothing about it. And then he would be destroyed with everybody else with it. But, but he acted on that faith. He decided to say, you know what, no, I believe God. I believe him so much. I'm going to, I'm going to get ready for this. I'm going to do what he's telling me to do. And I'm going to trust in God completely and get ready. And of course, he was saved by that from the, the flood of waters upon the earth, him and his family. Look at Abraham, verse number 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Talk about another man. You know, Abraham is like the father of faith is was, was referred to as Abraham is someone who, who God appeared to. He spoke to him and said, hey, I want you to, to pick up, move away from your family. You're going to go into this land. You don't even know. He didn't even know where he was going when he was sent. He said, well, just I'll let you know where to go. Just, just pick up and start moving. He had no idea where he was going. He had to have faith that Whatever God wanted him to do was the right thing for him to do. And you know, sometimes we, we you know, try to apply this in your life. You know, is there, is there somewhere where God wants you to be or something that God wants you to do that you might not even completely understand at this point? But we need to be able to have the faith to, to move on that and act on that. Now, Abraham, I believe, was, you know, I mean, he had audibly was, was able to hear God. God was able to speak unto Abraham. And I don't believe that God is audibly speaking to us today. I think he's already given us all of his word. I think his word is complete. However, I do believe that the Holy Spirit moves inside of us and, and leads us and guides us and directs our paths. And we need to have that faith that if, if we feel like we're being led down a certain path, you know, I wasn't sure, just, just to give you a little bit of a, of a personal testimony, you know, I... It wasn't my heart's desire from a young child to grow up and be a preacher man. Okay, it wasn't, I wasn't ever, you know, thinking like, man, one day I would love to be a pastor of a church. To be honest with you, I dreaded speaking in front of people ever. I'm a, I'm a computer programmer. I'm more of an introverted type of person by nature. It's kind of who, I, who I've been growing up. I've never had a huge group of friends, always a small, small number of people. I, I did well in school, but when it would come to speech class, you know, I had to take it in order to graduate high school. I dreaded it. It would give me, you know, sick to my stomach thinking of getting in front of anybody to say something. I would have to have like everything written down. I could not speak spontaneously. Dreadful. But when I finally, when I got saved and then got into a good church, my personality didn't really change. I was still the same type of person. But 
I heard it preached. I was in a great church, and I heard it preached from the pastor about how the importance of soul winning, the importance of you know, preaching the gospel unto other people. And to be honest with you, the thought of that scared me. It did. I was like, I, you know, you mean go up to a stranger, someone I don't even know, and talk to him? I can't do that. What do you mean? That's weird. I can't, you know, I, I, I don't know how to do that. But it's in God's word. And, and I was convinced this is something that we need to be doing. This is important because the message is way more important than your feelings, than your insecurity or your, 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 your inability to, to maybe talk to people. If you're going to offer up yourself as a sacrifice to God and say, God, here I am, I want you to use me, and I want to be obedient unto what you have for me to do, you have to get past yourself and get over yourself and be able to just do things. And I did, and I decided, you know what, this is more important. It may be uncomfortable for me, but no one ever promised that the Christian life was going to be comfortable. No one ever said that you just everything is going to be roses and everything is going to be dandy and fine. The Bible says, you know, yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I wasn't even thinking about persecution. I'm just talking about talking to people, right? <laughs> persecution is a whole nother level. We're just talking about just opening up our mouth and just being able to show somebody else a free gift of salvation. So in my personal life, I decided to do this. And I started going out and just being a silent partner and listening and learning and observing. And, and, and you know, it took a while, it took months before I was able to open up my mouth and speak. I was a shy person. But praise God, he's able to change us. He's able to lead us to the point, I mean, ultimately it got to the point, I don't want to go on and on about my own testimony, but it got to the point to where, you know, I love God. I, I, I was really growing and learning a lot to go into church and started my own, started doing a, a nursing home ministry and be able to start doing some preaching there and start doing a little bit of preaching in our church. And it got to the point where I said, hey, you know what? I meet these qualifications and I believe that God's calling me to do this. I believe God wants me to do this. I think there needs to be more churches that are, that are, thundering out the word of God and going out and doing the work for him, that I said, you know what, I can do this. And I, and I offered up myself to do this. But I didn't know, this whole time, I didn't know where I was going. I had no idea we'd end up in Prescott Valley, Arizona. I had no idea I'd be ending up, you know, being in church. But you have to have the willingness to be able to go wherever it is that God's leading you to go. It might mean moving somewhere else. It might mean not moving somewhere else. Might, you know, wherever it is that God wants you to go, we need to be able to follow that leading and, and trust God and just completely be faithful and act upon that faith by saying, you know what, God's, gonna, God's looking out for me. I think God's leading me here and I think this is something I need to be doing and you know, I might need to overcome some of my personal fears in order to follow through with that, but I'm going to do it. It might have been a fearful thing for Abraham to leave his whole family behind, don't you think? And just say, well, I'm just going to go somewhere into a heathen land. I don't know these people. We, we have a tendency to, to, to get comfortable in the, in the society that we live in today where we could, we could have a relative safety. I mean, we have our vehicles. We could travel from one place to the other and feel relatively secure and protected. And we could go into hotels and we could go into other lodgings. And there's, there's a lot of people around, hey, it wasn't like that back in the days of Abraham. When you do traveling, you, you had some serious concerns over people just robbing you and, and leaving you for dead. And, and it was a lot more dangerous or risky, you could say, of just going off into a strange land and just saying, well, I'm just going to go and live there. And, um, but Abraham did it. He, he, he was led by God he, and he obeyed the, uh, the calling of God. Let's jump down here back in Hebrews 11. Look at verse number... Um, let's look at verse number 13. Bible reads, These all died in faith, not having received the promises... But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And I love these, this, this short passage here where he's saying, look, they didn't receive the promises that were made to him. Abraham didn't physically receive the promises that were, that were made to him and to his seed that was to come. 
But he, he acted on it and, and did everything that God commanded him to, not having even received them in his time, as, as did um, Isaac and Jacob both. They, they all were doing the same thing. They were following the Lord, not even having received them, but they see him afar off. They knew it was coming. They, were, they had the foresight to say, I trust God. I believe him to be true. He's not a liar. If he's telling me this is going to happen, it's going to happen. No matter if I could even understand how it's going to happen, you know, Abraham's being told his seed was going to be like the multitude, like at the stars in heaven or the sand by the seashore. That's going to be the seed of Abraham. And he hadn't even had a child yet. And he's getting old. And he's thinking, okay, I believe you, God, but I mean, where is this going to come from? And finally, in Isaac, he had Isaac. And being 100 years old, he had Isaac. Right? And of that one, I mean, you said you just had to be faithful and, and just wait on the Lord and the Lord will deliver. The, the Lord will come through. But they seek a country. They seek, you know, they were looking for a place. They're not worried about the things of this earth. They were worried about the heavenly things. They were worried about, about uh, a, a heavenly country, it says in verse 16. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Just this week, my wife and I were out, uh, you know, we do some shopping on Craigslist. We, we like to get secondhand stuff because it's very affordable. And oftentimes we'll end up going to places where they have very nice homes. And where we went and picked up a vacuum cleaner from a home, very, very nice, ornate home, a very, very expensive place to live, I'm sure. And as we were driving home, you know, we we're commenting on some of the nice homes that were in the area. We're in Prescott, and there's, you know, the areas that are like, wow, you know, we're driving through here, and there's these nice big horse properties on the lake, and they've got all this stuff, and it's really nice. And while we were having this conversation, I felt some great joy. And what we're talking about is that, you know, I know if I put my mind to it, I could attain a significant amount of financial wealth in this world. I know if I really tried hard, I could, I could earn a lot of money. I have the, the drive to be able to do something like that. But the reason for my joy was not because I had this belief that I could attain this type of wealth. That had nothing to do with it whatsoever. But rather because I'm not wasting my time with that vanity. With the vanity of the riches of this world. Amen. Because that is all it is. To have this great big house and luxurious thing. Look, it's going to last for so short of a period of time on this worth. It's not worth it. You have to put in so much time and so much energy to accumulate your wealth and, and riches on this earth. And for what? It's all going to be burned up. It's all going to become nothing. And, and I'm honest with you, I'm trying to be honest with you tonight. You know, accumulating this, this a much greater reward from God really gave me a lot of joy. Having that faith and knowing that the work that I'm doing now, hey, we may not have very much financially. We may not may be living in the lap of luxury. But I know, I know for a fact that God is going to give me rewards in heaven for the work that I'm doing for him on this earth. I know it. And the work, the, the, the rewards that he's going to give to us is going to be so much greater than probably anybody can imagine. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Amen. We can't even imagine how great it's going to be and what he has for us. You see, salvation is a free gift. Your ticket into heaven is 100% free, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. But what you receive at the judgment seat of Christ, that is based on your works. Your entrance into heaven has nothing to do with your works whatsoever. But the good things that you do, your obedience to God, the faith that you show, and the, the hard work that you put forth for the kingdom of God, that is treasure that lasts forever. That is of eternal value. And at the judgment seat of Christ, when he tries all of your works in that fire, you know, the wood, hay, and the stubble is going to be burned up. But the gold, the silver, the precious stones, that's going to abide. And that's what we need to be focusing our time doing. Not on this money, the, the, the greenbacks that's going to be destroyed anyways, the properties that we have. It doesn't matter. You could enjoy that for a very short period of time on this earth, but if that's what you're devoting your life trying to get and trying to attain, you're going to end up at the judgment of Christ having everything burned up because it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. Now look, if God has blessed you with riches, I'm not preaching against you. If God has blessed you with a nice place to live, hey, praise the Lord for it, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. But we ought not to be 
that be our main focus in life is just accumulating a bunch of wealth. That's the point I'm trying to get across with this. We need to have faith to know that we're not wasting our time here. You know what the devil is going to try to do is try to make you feel like you're doing nothing, like you're not doing anything good for God. And I've been feeling this personally with the church because you know, we've been struggling trying to get the church to grow and trying to get more people and trying to do stuff. And what the devil is going to try to do is beat you down and say, yeah, what you're doing, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, you should just quit. Just give up. Don't worry about it. But no, we need to have faith to say, you know what, this is God's going to bless in his time. And what we're doing is not a waste of time. And I don't care. I, I, I've said this before. I'll say this to my wife. You know, if it's just me and my family meeting and preaching, and if nobody else ever comes to this church, I'm going to keep doing what I think is right. I'm going to keep preaching out of the Bible. And I'm going to keep doing it. And I'm not going to stop. Because you know what? We are making a difference. All we have to do is open up the bulletin and start looking at some of the people and we hear the testimonies of people that are getting saved and people that are putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, they may not all be showing up here to church tonight, but I'll tell you what, we're still doing a good work for the Lord. And it's not going to stop. And the only way you know, to get discouraged would be, you know, if you get discouraged would be to quit. That's the only way you're going to fail. But if you can just, just stick through it, be faithful, and, and have the, the vision and the foresight of, of a heavenly country, not something that's on this earth, that's what we need to have to get through the hard times. Let's keep reading here in Hebrews chapter 11. Probably one of the biggest actions of faith ever taken by an individual. Again, we're going to see Abraham in verse number 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. As I mentioned earlier, Abraham, right? Isaac's the son of his old age. He's 100 years old. He finally receives this son and he sees a little glimmer into the future of the blessings that were promised to him by God. And then years down the road, God calls on him and says, hey, I want you to, I want you to offer up your son. I want you to sacrifice him. And to see Abraham not stumble at that. And the Bible tells us why. Verse number 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. God had, or Abraham had so much faith in the Lord that even when God said, okay, Abraham, I want you to go up on this mountain. I want you to offer up, I want you to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. And when you go back and you see that story, you see all the great imagery of Jesus Christ, how Isaac carried the, the wood on his shoulders going up the hill and the, and the ram caught in the thicket. And uh, you know, We went through this in our Genesis series, but there's so much foreshadowing and symbolism of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to offer up himself as a sacrifice for the whole world. But um, just put yourself in Abraham's shoes and just be like, man, you know, the, the, son, the, the, the promise that God made to me is through Isaac and now you're asking me to offer him up. Abraham was willing to withhold nothing from serving God. Remember, Jesus Christ said, He that loved father or mother more than me is not worthy than me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Abraham was able to, to give everything unto God and to offer it up. And, and through faith, knowing, that, knowing also that God is, you know, the mockers of the Bible will try to come and say, Oh, yeah, Abraham was some lunatic hearing voices in his head and being told to kill people. No. That is, not, that is the farthest thing from the truth. Abraham knows God's character. Abraham knows and, and believed wholeheartedly that because it's true that God was, was leading him down this path and testing him and he knew that God is able to raise up Isaac from the dead. He fully believed. That's why he told his servants that were with him, he said, the lad and I were coming back. He didn't believe he was going up there and his son was going to be dead and he's just going to be coming back by himself because he knew that if God wanted him to do this, that God's going to raise him back from the dead and be that, that, that full picture of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, which is what the, the, the whole point of that was, is symbolizing the, and prophesying of the future events. <clears throat> Let's skip ahead a little bit here in, in Hebrews 11. There's, there's so many great stories. I can't cover them all. We're going to cover a little bit about Joseph in, in, the, in the coming weeks in our Wednesday night Bible study. But it goes on about Isaac and about Joseph and Moses. 
Well, let's look into Moses a little bit because, again, we could apply this to our life. You know, with, we had Abraham going into a place he didn't know, but he, he still obeyed God's calling. Let's look at, uh, at Moses, verse number 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses was a man, he was, bought, he was brought up in a wealthy environment, brought up as, as basically as a son of Pharaoh. Um, but when he came to years, it says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. As a Christian, as a, as a born-again believer in God, you might find yourself having an opportunity to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You might find yourself being able to just disregard the Bible and just, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to sin. And hey, it's the truth. If you're born again, nothing can remove that salvation from you. You have the opportunity to go out and enjoy the pleasure of sin and not have to worry about your salvation being lost. It is a foolish thing to do. It's a very stupid thing to do, but it is a possibility that you have to do. You could go and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but we need to have the attitude like Moses had, the faith that Moses had, where instead of enjoying the pleasures of sin for that very short time that you have on this earth, verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And I love, I love that it mentions Christ talking about Moses. Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ. He knew there was a Messiah coming. He knew there was a Christ coming, and that's who his faith was in. His faith was in Jesus Christ, even if he didn't know him by the name of Jesus. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. He knew that if he would just do the right thing, be with the people of God, yeah, he's going he's gonna to experience reproach for that because the, the Israelites were, were under bondage. They were in slavery. They were being mistreated. But if he joined himself unto the people of God, he knew that his reward was going to be much greater by doing the right thing and going through the hard times. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. We need to remember that in, in hard times when they come in our life. The persecutions that come, the afflictions that come, that to have the faith of Moses knowing that if you go through persecutions and trials and tribulations, God's got a crown waiting for you up in heaven. You need to abide faithful and he will, he's, he's going to reward you faithfully himself. Let's jump down to verse number 33 here. Verse number 33, we're almost done. We see many victories wrought through people who had faith. Or verse number 32, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. All of these people that are known for their faith because of the actions that they've done. The, the way that they showed their faith and, and their obedience to God. Verse number 33, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. I mean, think about that with Daniel and the lions then, right? The faith that he had of God to keep him safe. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Being thrown into a burning, fiery furnace, yet they had faith that they're not going to bow the knee to the false idol. They're not going to bow their knee unto Baal. They're going to stand firm on the word of God and they have faith. You know what? God's, I, I love their answer. Their answer is the best. They say, you know what, King Nebuchadnezzar? We're not careful to answer thee in this matter. They say, because our God is able to deliver us from that burning fire first. And he says, but let it be known. You know, if he, doesn't, if he decides not to do this, if God's not willing to, to save us, he's completely capable of doing it. But if he's not willing to do it, let it be known. We will not bow down and worship your God. I love I love that attitude. You know what? Praise God for the faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. That they are not willing for anything. They we're not going to do it. God's capable of saving us, and if He doesn't, that's fine with us because we are not going to lose our faith in Him. We are going to stay strong and stand firm on what He has told us to do. 
Great victories. And God brings people through that with these great victories. Verse number 34, quench the violence of fire is what I was just referring to. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Waxed valiant in fight. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. You see all throughout the Old Testament where they're having these battles and the children of Israel are going up. They're outnumbered by, you know, a hundred to one or a thousand to one in some cases where the enemy is just much greater than them and God delivers them because they have faith in the Lord, because they had gone and sought counsel from the Lord and that God was protecting them. These are all the victories that we see. Women receive their dead, raised to life again. But faith also brings trials. We have to remember with faith, hey, we need faith in the good times. We need faith that, that God can deliver us and God can bring all these great victories. But you know what? It doesn't always turn out that way. But we still need to maintain our faith. Let's keep reading here, verse number, the, the second half of verse number 35. It said, women received their dead, raised to life again. Praise the Lord for that. It's a great victory. But look at this. And others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. They're going to receive a better resurrection because they're going through this stuff for the cause of Christ. They're being, they're being tortured and tormented for the cause of Christ and God is going to reward them for keeping their faith. Verse number 36, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. All these terrible things happening to the people of God. But I love this parenthetical statement in, in, in verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. These are people that gave their lives to the cause of Christ. And ultimately, for the lost, for people who, you know, for the unbelievers, they're not worthy of them. They were living up to a higher standard. And they were, they were willing to go through all of these things that they had to go through, being stoned, being, I mean, being sawn asunder, being cut in half. It's, it's, a, it's incredible. It's incredible what, what people have gone through, the martyrs have gone through, what Christians have gone through in time past. And you know what? It's going to be in times to come also. There's going to be extreme persecution coming against Christianity. You better believe it. We need to be prepared for that. That's why, you know, that's why a sermon like this is important. You don't want your faith to be shaken when the hard times come, when you're faced with persecution, when you're faced with something that, that you feel God's leading you to do that you, you know, you're not quite sure you, you should be doing that. Or you're maybe a little intimidated or scared about doing that. We need to be strong in our faith and think back to all of these people in this great chapter where we can see these great examples that we can learn from them and say, hey, you know what? If they can do it, I can do it too. Oftentimes, all we need is a great example from somebody else before us showing us the way to give you that extra boost, to give you that extra confidence to say, you know what? It may seem impossible, but this person did it. If they can do it, well, I'm going to try to do it too because I think I can too. And you know what? Obviously, we know God can do all things. I can do all things through God which strengthens me. God is able to get us through all of these things. But it's nice for us. It's a benefit to be able to see the faith of others and to see that God has performed and, and helped them through these times. Let's finish up reading here. Verse number 38. Uh, of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. He's talking about all these people who say, you know what? They've got this great report through their faith. They've done all these good things. It could be seen and known that they, they, they acted on their faith in such a great manner. They didn't even receive the promises. I mean, they're going to. They're still, the time's coming. But they, they, they kept the faith, not having even received the promise. God having provided some better thing for us. It's a great chapter. You know, this chapter never gets old for me. It's a very, very popular, common chapter that's taught on, the faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. There's so many great stories, but 
We need the edification from time to time. We need to be reminded of our faith. And hey, if you have the faith today, what's stopping you from sharing that faith with others? Hopefully it's not your own fears. Hopefully there's nothing that, that, that is going to prevent you from being able to be more vocal about your faith. And we can look at the people that have gone through much worse than we have. When we have our own trials and tribulations and things that happen, we can always look back. And, and I can't speak for every individual in this room, but when you look at what people in the Bible have gone through, I, I don't know of anybody who's gone through anything close to what they've gone through. Not yet. For sure, not yet. And, and I believe it's to come. I do believe it's to come. But right now, let's, let's not be a, a wimpy Christian and, and let the small things knock us out and make us lose our faith because the serious persecution hasn't even started yet. Don't let these things... Hey, take strength in these. And I know when, you know when we're going through our times, they seem to be sometimes the biggest things in the world. But let's put things in perspective. Read Hebrews 11 when you're going through times like that and look what people really went through. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great chapter on faith, dear Lord. I pray that you would please increase our faith. Lord, help us to, to act more on our faith. Help us to act just knowing that your word is true and that everything that we do, the choices that we make in our life, knowing that the Bible is true, that your words are true, dear Lord, that we can have complete confidence and have no wavering or no shaking and no doubting in our mind that we're doing the right thing because we're following your word, dear Lord. And we pray that you would please bless us for keeping our faith and help us just to remain strong and help us ultimately, dear God, to share our faith with other people and to get over whatever our insecurities might be for not doing so, dear God. Strengthen us and embolden us, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.